Now, as we're going to see, the steps and final bearing assembly are essentially the same as the assembly we've already watched during the lead wire work. Before beginning assembly, however, the workman removes any remaining grease from the bearing journal. He wipes it off, as always, using a clean lint-free cloth. After wiping off the grease, he performs a very careful and very important inspection. He looks down into the lower portion of the bearing housing to be sure that no dirt, grit, or foreign material got in there during the repair work. Next, he prepares the top half of the bearing for assembly. He performs a visual inspection and again wipes it with a clean lint-free cloth to remove excess grease that remains from the work he's already done. After wiping off the top half of the bearing housing, he applies oil in two important locations. He applies it to the journal of the bearing, and he also applies it to the top half of the bearing shell. This way, the bearing is pre-lubricated, you might say, before assembly. Then he checks the match mark on the upper bearing housing to be certain he installs it in the proper orientation. He then lowers the housing carefully over the studs and into position. As I said before, if spacers or gaskets are used on any particular bearing, they have to be installed before the top half of the housing is set into position. With the bearing housing in position, the two dowel pins are inserted as before. That is, they're set in their holes and then tapped down with a hammer. It's important that this step is done before the nuts are installed or tightened so that you can assure yourself that the two halves of the housing are in proper alignment. Then the nuts are installed on their studs and threaded down by hand before tightening with a torque wrench. As before, the nuts must be tightened in the proper sequence and to the proper torque value. You can find this information in the manufacturer's instruction book. After torquing the studs for the bearing, the workman sets his torque wrench aside. He has very few steps left to assemble the bearing. The remaining steps are involved with bearing lubrication. The next thing the workman does is to reinstall the oil drain plug in the bearing housing. Now this is a pretty basic procedure. It's simply a matter of threading the drain plug into its opening, taking care not to cross the threads and thereby damage them. After the plug is threaded in by hand, he, of course, does a final tightening of the plug with a wrench. Next, he's ready to refill the bearing oil reservoir. Now, in this example, he has already measured out the right amount of the proper type of oil. Now, how does he know the amount and type of oil? Well, in our example, he has referred to the manufacturer's instruction book. However, in your plant, you may have special facility procedures which spell out this sort of information. In either case, the proper amount of the proper type of oil is placed in the bearing oil reservoir. Then, before going any further, the workman checks the sight glass provided to make sure that the oil is now at the expected level. So he checks the sight glass to be sure that he has added the proper amount of oil. If the equipment was placed back in operation with inadequate lubrication, he'd end up doing another bearing overhaul right away. Next, he installs the bearing oil cap. And with that, the bearing assembly is complete. But he still performs one more important step. He test operates the equipment by hand. By that, I mean using a strap wrench, he physically turns the shaft of the equipment to check for any binding of the bearing. Now, I should alert you that in most cases, this is a recommended procedure. But in some special cases, the manufacturer may instruct you not to turn the shaft by hand, but rather to wait until a forced lubrication system is in service. So before doing this, be sure you check manufacturer's instructions. In this case, the shaft turned easily by hand, indicating the equipment was ready to be placed back in service. So at this point, then, the bearing overhaul procedures are complete. And as I said, the equipment is ready to be returned to service. But after the tags have been removed and the valves have been operated and the equipment has been started, one more very important step is required. That's a careful inspection and examination of the bearing in operation. This is simply a verification step, if you will, that the maintenance work has been performed properly. Now, it will be some time before this particular pump is ready to be started. However, bearing inspection procedures are the same for virtually all equipment using this type of bearing. So let's look at a different piece of equipment which has just been placed in operation and see what's involved in a typical bearing inspection. On any bearing equipped with a slinger ring, the first thing that should be done after starting the equipment 
is to look inside the housing to verify that the slinger ring is turning properly, providing lubrication for the bearing. The seals on each end of the bearing housing should be checked to be sure that oil isn't being lost from the housing. And you should physically feel the bearing for indications of excessive or unusual vibration or excessive temperature. You should check whatever type of oiling system is provided to be sure the proper amount of lubricant is in it. And using a sounding rod, a screwdriver, a dowel, or some similar item, check for unusual noises in the bearing. By holding one end of a rod against the bearing at 